Hey guys, uh, welcome back to Covenant Podcast. Today I have two very special guests. I don't really know if y'all are guests anymore though. We're family. We're like family now. We've been friends for so long now that we just pick up where we left off, honestly. Yeah. And uh, so we got uh, David Robbins, Catherine Mullins, and they're going to be in for a weekend of worship with us. And so while they're here, we figured we'd take full advantage of them and and just do some <laughs> podcasts uh, with them, a podcast with them because it's always so fun. To just have a conversation about the church. I'm generally located here all the time, and they travel all over the place. And so I like to pick their brains a little bit about what's going on in the church. But uh, before we do that, we're going to talk a little bit about what's going on in your personal lives, what kind of ministry you've been up to. Uh, you got an exciting future thing that God's opened up this year that maybe some of our people don't know about. Uh, and so we'll start with you, David, since you're sitting there smiling like that. And uh, you can tell us. <laughs> What's going on in y'all's lot, your life? Well, uh, we've had a very uh, busy last year, but very just fulfilling last year. So we ran really hard, and we had some crazy stuff happen. We had a tornado hit our house, an F4 tornado. I don't know if you saw the stuff on the news in noon, and, and so we were in the house when it happened, you know, and uh, just <laughs> kind of holding each other open that we don't die. <laughs> but uh, so we had a tornado hit. We moved. <laughs> we didn't die, praise God. We didn't die. Uh uh, we did a lot of traveling, a lot of ministry, and uh, so it was really good. It was just a running season. And then uh, towards the end of the year, uh, we just felt the Lord starting to kind of shift gears for us and even kind of pull us in a newer direction. I'll even let Catherine, you know, talk on that if she wants to some. And uh, so, yeah, here we are now, and um, we're excited to be here and worship with you guys. And you, you all really are family. I remember just the connection that we felt, you know, the first time that we came here. Absolutely. And uh, it's it's not that way everywhere we go, you know. So all you people that are listening where it's not that way, y'all need to get busy. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Get with it. <laughs> <laughs> no, we did. We felt like that. Day one, I remember the first time I ever met you guys. I don't even remember how long ago it was now, but I just I just knew that we would have a forever relationship, you know, and that uh, y'all were like, y'all would be family. And I know that people say that all the time. Yeah. Well, y'all are family to us, but really... We do keep up with each other all year long and with what's going on in each other's lives. And I knew about the tornado because Catherine puts stuff on Facebook sometimes. That's right. Yeah, I forgot about that. But anyway, what do you think? What's going on in your life? Your turn. So uh, I agree with David. It was a busy but beautiful year last year. Uh, we did 55 conferences in 40 weeks. So it was really, really busy and then throwing a tornado. And on that was an interesting thing. But uh, we made it and the Lord was really faithful and it's just been amazing to see what God is doing in the nation, that the, ch the church is alive. <laughs> and and in many ways, the church is alive and well, which right. I, I love I love seeing. Uh, but I think the biggest change for us, and, and we haven't you know let tons and tons of people know, uh, but we're going to let you guys know, let, let all of you guys in on a little secret. It won't be a secret in a minute. <laughs> it will not right. be a secret in a minute. So for a few years now, we have um, kind of just been praying about landing the plane more and traveling less. And so um, we are um, at my dad's church. Obviously, that's kind of been our home base for a long time, but I haven't been on staff or anything. So I'm coming on staff part time there and we're um, we're taking the title executive pastors there. So that's kind of a really fun transitional uh, change that we didn't see coming at all. Yep. Um, you know, if, if you had said that we're going to be back home pastoring, helping my dad pastor, uh, that would have been really off my radar. I would have loved, I love it. And, you know, if my 18 year old self, that's what all I wanted to do was be on staff at my dad's church. Right. So it's really been an answer to prayer and an answer to the, answer to the desires of my heart. And that David has such a heart for that. It's really a beautiful thing. So we are not traveling as much this year. So, um, I mean, 55 trips, we're, we're going down to like 20 trips this year, maybe. Um, we're we're going to still, still do ramp trips. And then, of course, we want to still see you guys. So Yeah, we'll bring you back one more time this year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we love it. And we're excited about this uh, season and what God has in store. I, I think it's neat that, you know, just I, I remember the very first time that, uh, that I met David. Um, and, and you'd been at the ramp and you'd done albums or whatever they call them now. Uh, still called albums. Not. Do they still call <laughs> yeah. them albums? Records. One the records. <laughs> the, the 33s and 45s, whatever. No. But but I remember uh, you guys had just gotten married not too long before you came here. And I, I just remember watching. I uh, felt like David was coming into his own in ministry. Like I always was really, I don't know, I really admired that part about you, you know, that 
your your wife's like everybody knows about her in, in the United States, and you, and then you 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 come along and you. I saw no insecurity in that whatsoever. I thought, what an incredible. Why did you have some? No, no, no. I just thought very ignorant, confident. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but I, I just feel like y'all just flowed together. And to me, yeah, to hear that come into the the in the focus where God has raised you up together, executive pastors, doesn't surprise me at all. But it's exciting for me, you know, to to see that happen in you guys. And I feel like uh, that that cover and that headship of God with you over her ministry. Is he's honoring that, I believe, with the way you've both honored that in each other. So what do you think? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I love that. And I don't you're just a really good pastor because you see that you see, I feel like when you talk, it's not someone that talks of just like, hey, I'm a pastor. It's it is like a father figure. And I just even when we were in the community, we go out to old. eat and, and stuff. So yeah, I really admire that about you and all the things you spoke over my life and Catherine's and um we really appreciate that. And yeah, it's just good. It's exciting. And it's, it's a, it's a whirlwind in a good way because when God calls you to something, you don't get all the answers right away. You don't know what it's going to look like. And when you started birthing this inside of us and even just kind of that desire for that local church, uh, we didn't really know what it was going to look like. And even just in the transitions, you know, even now we don't fully know what everything's going to look yeah. like, but we're excited and we're just saying yes to God. And uh, even just anyone listening, that's what I would encourage you to do Amen. is many times when the Lord calls you to something, when he, when he brings a change, he's not going to give you all the answers. A lot of times there's going to be a step of faith. And, uh, and I just encourage you to say yes, yes Amen. to it and seek counsel, seek godly counsel. Yeah. You know, we, we've definitely done that. It's good. And it's to, to you, it's your home. And that's very rare, by the way, uh, for somebody to pastor where they grew up, you know, just yeah. I'm doing that now. That's yeah. why I know it's strange, because I remember um, saying yes to God wherever, you know, I had been in youth ministry for 12, 13 years teaching school. But I, day one, I knew God was was going to lead me into a, a pastor in a church somewhere. And I had no clue it would be covenant, you know, but just a yes and him raising me up in this town where I grew up in. And now you and now your heart is so connected to that community as well. I just feel like that's, uh, while it, it might be odd to us, it's, it's just like the father, right? To let you, the Bible says, if you delight yourself in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. And what he's given you is the desire of your heart to follow your dad. Mm -hmm. And, and, and then, your other half, your headship, your your man, your your hero in the faith in a lot of ways now is is with you on that. What a what a gift. Yeah. Well, and I've loved it too, because uh David has such a pastor's heart. And like you said, maybe people when we travel don't see that as much. But when we're at home, he is he is He's a pastor. Your boss. No. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he is my boss. <laughs> Uh, that is, there could be so many jokes right there. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I was hoping I'd lead y'all into one. Yeah. <laughs> it's a trap. <laughs> it is a trap. You are trapped if you say anything. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, so even at home, um, I, I, I feel like people view him as pastor. I probably relationally have to work more in the relationship side than he is, is going to have to, um, just cause he's been planted there so long and he's been the worship director there, uh, for a few years now. Um, but yeah, we're excited about the journey and I do love it. I love um, his leadership and his headship has really just been so uh, such a security for me and what I do. And what I'm so grateful about with David is he is secure and um, his leadership has really um, opened the door for me. I feel like to be able to do what I'm called to do um, in a uh, peaceful way. Yeah. And uh, so it's really, there's nothing like having excellent leadership in your life. So thanks babes for that. This is really nice. This whole podcast is about me. <laughs> and I, it's really sweet, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> well, I remember giving you, and I don't know if you remember this, uh, but y'all tend to remember every single word, it seemed like. But I remember giving God give me a very specific word to you the very first time y'all were here mm -hmm. about your headship and, and how that would lead this ministry. This ministry how yeah. Most people would view it like, He's in the background, doesn't do anything or whatever. You know, he just plays. Behind, he's our backup. But if if anybody's around you guys, 
any amount of time, they see the dynamics of your relationship and the way you honor David and the way you honor your wife. Yeah. It's always been a blessing to me. And so I'm really proud of this next step. And that the fact that you get to do it where your, where your dad did it is, is amazing. My, uh, it's kind of a side note, but my, my dad's birthday is December 27th. And every year at Christmas, I always, uh, there's a part of Christmas. My dad's passed away when I was 24 years old and my dad and I were really like, I mean, he, I'm him. Yeah. I hear myself all the time say stuff. And I thought, sound like my dad, I have my dad's personality. I have my dad's quirky, funny side, you know, like my sarcastic sometimes side. I love that by the way. <laughs> um, and, um, this year in particular, I don't know why I just, I had this sense of missing my dad and, um, uh, not that I hadn't had many of many of those years, but this year, I don't even know why it was. It was, and so I took a trip a couple of days after Christmas on my dad's birthday, actually, Eastern North Carolina, where my dad pastored the two churches that I I was in as a little kid. Just went back and spent three or four days in in those communities, seeing some of the people in those communities, and uh, and I don't know, I don't know why or or I don't know what possessed me to do that. But I felt such a peace about going back where my legacy was birthed kind of almost. Even though my, my my grandparents and my parents were from Lincolnton, that that trip back eastern North Carolina was such a blessing to me to get to just go back and look where my dad ministered and pastored. And uh, I really believe I'm in ministry probably uh, because of him. And I thought my whole life I would not be in ministry because of some of the hurts I saw him in, in ministry, but now I'm, I'm able to, to look at it from the other side of that corner and just be so excited that I'm following in my dad's footsteps, you know, in a lot of ways in, 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 in my hometown and uh, the legacy of the faith in my family is such a huge thing for me. And, uh, I just embraced it more this year. But uh, anyway, I'd rather get back to talking about David because now we're talking about me. <laughs> well, and you said uh, a term legacy. And this is something I think, you know, and I'm 37, but there's things that are becoming more important to me and things like legacy from the generation that came before us and remembering and preserving things that need to be preserved and protected. And that is one of the things that really just Catherine and I are passionate about with this is that her dad created a legacy and there are things to be preserved and protected. Even just when Moses and, and uh, the people of Israel, you know, one of the messages that God gave them was, was don't forget. Yeah. And, and I feel like there's a tendency right now to forget and try to move forward, Amen. you know, to grow. And there are things that change or technologies change and that's fine and that's good, but there are things that do need to be preserved. And um, so I love that, you know, and I love that uh, your dad had a legacy and, you know, yeah, and, and, and the legacy that. of covenant before I became the pastor, I, our former pastor and the people who planted this place uh, are it's, it's something I'm very thankful for all the time. You know, my personal prayer life, I'm forever remembering, you know, that somebody yeah. was here before yeah. me. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, that's a big deal. And, uh, and, and you're right. Uh, sometimes the change that happens with from one generation to the next, especially in worship and music, uh, Sometimes those people that planted the thing that we're that paved the road we're walking on will sometimes feel forgotten, and I think it's really important for us to let them know they never will be, and that we're grateful for what they did. And while it may look different now, yeah, uh, it's because of what they did that that got the body of Christ to this place, this space, this place in 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 history. So anyway, that was good. That was good. I appreciate you uh, reminding me of that because I, I think it's some, uh, pretty important. Uh, I know I'm shifting gears here a little bit, uh, and we can go back and talk about anything you want to talk about. But we had lunch together today before we, we did this, and uh, we were just talking about uh, – I always find it interesting. I'm pretty much planted here. I do stuff in our community, and once in a while we'll speak at other people's churches. I'm, in, I'm speaking at like a men's conference and – Winston Salem in May, and I get invited oh, sometimes. Awesome. Different things like that, but most of my ministry is spent here in Lincolnton because I have such a a passion and love for our local church. Covenant is the most incredible church in the history of the world to me. I love these people, and um, 
But as you guys travel around, this last year and a half, two years has been as strange of a time in the history of church. Well, <laughs> the history we know as uh, as I've watched. And I just kind of wanted to get you, you guys' take on what's going on in the church universally in this moment when uh, I, I don't believe, let me say it, let me say this, I, I don't believe by any means that God created the pandemic, you know. Uh, I think um, the enemy is responsible for all sickness and disease. <laughs> but, and I also think the enemy would would have, would have been very pleased that the church just folded up, covered its head up, and went into this undisclosed location. But I, I'm seeing some of the opposite of that happening. What, what's your experience as you travel around and see the church? Yeah, you? you know, I, I agree. Um, it's like the enemy tried, tried to deal a specific hand to the church, to the world. Um, and the beautiful thing about God, and this is why I love his kingdom, is that he works everything together for our good. So it can be the worst situation, unfathomable, an unfathomable situation, and he can still begin to turn things around for our good and his glory. So that's what we're seeing right now. I feel like, you know, all over, yep. all over America, yep. um, the church came to a, a place where they kind of had to make a decision and it was either they're going to fold under the pressure or they're going to stand in faith and watch, watch God move and believe that God is going right. to move. And so I, I personally have seen such a strengthening all over the body of Christ. I know, I know that there have been churches that have folded. Um, and I don't know, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to say it was because they had lack of faith. I have no idea their story, you know? Right. Um, but I, I have seen churches who they could have folded and they didn't. And it's been so incredible to see this, the, the, um, their story unfold and the faithfulness of God fold, um, just unfold in their lives. And we're really seeing people get back to, I believe what the church was meant to be all yeah. along. And I you know encountering the presence of God, um, doing life together community. Um, so it's really been a beautiful thing to see. I, I personally believe the church is alive and well, that's yeah. my stance. Yeah. I feel like it's, it's, a, and I tell our church this often just to remind them that there's never been a more exciting time than now. Yes. And I think if we're not careful, the culture, uh, pushed back a little bit. I don't, I know our battle is not against flesh and blood and I know it's not uh, against any specific uh, political party or or group of people or whatever, our battle is against the enemy, you know. Yes. And and That's I, right. I'm, and I'm good on that, but I I do believe that this was a test moment. I don't I don't think it was nearly as as severe as it could have been. I don't want to overstate that. Oh my God, we've been through some great uh, beat down or whatever. I don't think that's true, uh, but I do believe that the church uh, had to stop and pull aside and, and make some decisions about coming back together. Yeah. When what's our response going to be? Because there's a tendency, in, in my opinion, this could be wrong, from people who didn't understand why we're still meeting and why we're meeting together and, and with COVID. It, I think sometimes they tend to believe that we don't believe COVID is real or that it yeah. happened. And every one of us have lost good friends from COVID. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. It's real. We acknowledge that it's real, but even even the, even with it being real, I just felt like for us, for me as a pastor of this church, that we had to at some point draw a line and say we're not going we're not going to spend the rest of our journey on the earth apart from one another. The body of Christ needs each other; it needs itself. And uh, and so when we made a decision to to come back in, it wasn't like blind faith i believe we did it with prayer and, and, and wisdom and tried to do it the best we could but at the same time it was just time you know and uh and and, and i think that's what you're saying you're seeing uh, as you travel around that that churches have decided we're going we're going to still be the church there was a lot of churches especially when we started 2021 that were just all right we've had enough our doors are wide open and one of the things that I, amazed me was how hungry people were to just get back in. And even people that weren't what you would call normal churchgoers, all of a sudden were coming to church because people were hungry for the presence of God. They were hungry for something real. People, especially I think COVID brought out a lot of the internal struggles and issues and maybe even increased a lot of the internal battles that people have. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden they're like, this is not fixing it. What I'm, what I'm trying is not working. I need to get in the church, I need to experience God. And so we've just, I've noticed a, a major hunger 
and shift, you know, just in a lot of people. And, you know, I'm very guilty of this when I wasn't a leader, you know, of disagreeing with decisions leadership would make in certain areas. And that's just, it's always going to be like that, that you can't please everybody. It's, it's going to be impossible to please everybody. And uh, a lot of people just don't understand, you know, all the circumstances involved behind every decision. You know, they're not in those rooms, in the back rooms and weighing everything and, and discussing everything. It's not like, you know, pastors are just like, hey, we're just going to do this and not think anything about it. A lot of these things have been discussed, Amen. you know, yeah. and um, so. Anyway. Yeah, and I agree with that. I think it's hard because we we fully acknowledge that COVID exists. And I, I love that you even brought up that point. I think the thing that where it gets hard is pastors not only have to acknowledge that COVID exists, they have to acknowledge that depression exists that anxiety exists, that abuse exists, and a lot of these other issues that are very real. And the battle for the soul exists. Yes, the battle for the soul. Exactly. So there are so many different battles that exist. And so we can't ignore an entire group of hurting people, you know, just to take care of COVID. We need to take care of, you know, people who are, I obviously, you know, believe that are susceptible to COVID and all those different things. But there, there's a whole nother group of people whose lives are hanging in the balance that we've got to, we've got to, we're responsible for. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that's where it's like the church has to be the church and the church isn't the church just in good times. The church is the church still in hard times. Amen. And what we saw here personally was exactly what you just described. And, and we'd really not had this conversation, uh, before coming on the camera, but what we saw in our church is these people like just, I mean, I, I don't, I didn't know where they all came from. So many hungry, broken, uh, beat down, searching for answers, people that I've, I've never seen more excitement in our church than I see right now. And yeah, praise God. It's, it is, man. It's just like this group of people that God brought into our church in the last year. It's, it's like revival, man. It was like we, you know, baptizing more people we've baptized in the history of our church. More people are. Or joining than we we've ever had joined, and and I don't say any of that to promote covenant because it's it's there's not a Bible verse that says if you lift up covenant or Mike Divine, I'll draw all men unto you. It says if you lift up Jesus, I will. And uh, and I I was in a uh, mentioned this to you guys earlier. I was in a a, a, a meeting with the, the local Gideons uh, do a uh, a breakfast for us pastors in our community once a year and I've always just I really appreciated their work that they do and one of the speakers said that as they've traveled around on what they do that they, they've had a lot of churches there that you nobody can can say that pandemic didn't change things because we've had churches that are that are smaller and weaker but we've had this other side of it of churches that just just blew up in a beautifully good way and uh I, I I guess I'm, my question to you guys, uh, besides the hunger and all that stuff, what, what are what are some of the reasons? What are some of the things those churches are doing that are that are growing now? You know, like that are that are vibrant, not barely hanging on, but I mean, like boom. And I know all three of us know the Holy Spirit is responsible for all of the good. Every good and perfect gift comes from Him, and nowhere else. Uh, but are there some things that are specific to the churches that are really growing? Yeah. Um, I, I think Catherine will probably have a lot of good answers for this, but something you said, it kind of made me think that the good gifts and, and all that stuff comes from God. I be, But I do believe there is a responsibility of stewardship for everything we're getting. It's like the parable of the talents that you're given talents and it's in God is looking at you. What are you going to do with these? And even practically with this question, I think there are things that the church needed to adjust to, you know, that it's not, it's not, we can't just make up the rules and we say we want life to be this way, that when life deals you a certain hand, you have to make the best with it. And I think some churches with COVID, we had to adjust like practical things like our communication strategies. How do we stay in contact with our church body? Right. How do we get the message out there? Hey, we're having a service or hey, this. And, you know, and I think there are practical things that were adjusted that churches thrive because they were able to adjust. And then ones that didn't that said, hey, 
we've always done it this way and we're just going to keep doing things this way, I think maybe felt a little bit of the pain, you know, of either not growing or decreasing in size or even, you know, to the point of closing their doors, yeah. you know, and I love, I'm very practical thinker with some of these things. And I, you know, approach even like a lot of ministry this way of like, Lord, you've given me these talents. Now I want to make the best these. I want to multiply these. I don't just want to bury them in guard, you know, and try to protect them if that makes sense. Yeah. So. Well, and we, I love hearing these stories. I love hearing your story. I, I feel like, probably a hundred percent of the churches that we go to, it's like I'm talking to their pastor right now because they've experienced growth. They've experienced the protection and provision of the Lord. Uh, even financially, they've been in a better place, you know, tithe wise, which is a miracle. You know, you mean to tell me that we may, we might not have been opened as, as much or, you know, different things have happened. People have been losing their jobs and you're, you're telling me that tithe is still up. People are still giving. And, and for me, I feel like I look at these churches and, and we were, we came to a place of testing. And I think the the question God was asking the church is, are you going to return to the ancient path? And I know that's, that's the gospel message. And that's the presence of Jesus. It's not complicated. It's not the lights. It's not all of the bells and whistles that the American church has, even though I'm grateful for those, you know, I, I, I like nice buildings. I like lights. I like all of that, but it was an invitation. I feel like to return to the ancient paths, to return to, to purity, to return to holiness. And so from where we've seen it, it's people pressing in and just sharing the gospel message. And what I think is so amazing is we've gotten back to the gospel really works. Yes, it does. Yeah. And it's, and yeah. it's the only thing that does. Yeah, you know? it, that's totally it. It's not the bells and whistles that save people and keep people. Exactly. And I, I've, I see this this post, and I don't want to step on any toes, but I, I see this post goes around about once a month on Facebook where uh, it's almost like I, I feel like I, I almost want to defend the way we worship. Uh, it says, uh, I'm just ready for the church to get back to the old hymns and quit singing these new contemporary whatever that's going on in the church, and they're just losing something. And then I look at our church and churches like ours, which we do some hymns. I love old hymns. Uh, yeah. But I just don't believe that's true. I believe most times you're, if you're if you're actually putting that on Facebook, it's probably because your church doesn't sing that kind of music. <laughs> and Because churches like ours, we never put stuff out there like, you need to switch over from hymns to contemporary music, whatever. But but I, I do believe all those things are connected together. When you said something right then that really, really like touched something in me, like I, I've watched our worship go deep this year yeah. in in a way like I've That's never awesome. never seen it before and 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 and, and while, while I, I'm not sure uh, let me say this I bet when the people in the 1930s started singing old rugged cross and the hymns the, the people before them thought oh my gosh the church is blowing it now you know now because a lot of the the way we worship is different uh, than the churches I grew up in Maybe it's not different from the church everybody else grew up in out there listening. But I I feel like there's an intensity to the song now, to the worship. Oh, yeah. You know. I, I feel like some of the songs that, that I loved growing up that I still love were a, a, a whole lot about me, you know. E- even Amazing Grace, uh, sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. You know, it's a song about God's amazing grace. Lord knows I'm not saying anything negative about Amazing Grace. It's every time I hear that song, it touches something deep inside my soul. But what I see in in the, in the new music that's, that people are writing now is it's, it's not about me and it's not about us. It's it's a and it's not a song about Jesus. It's a song to Him. So good. And so good. It's a uh, and that's what worship is, and that's what I've watched in our church. It's people that are that are coming and singing worship songs to the Father, and He's become so personal. And I think the pandemic drove us to that. By the way, totally. Yeah, you know, that we we could no longer live on the peripheral of our faith life, and everybody I believe had to make a decision. And maybe we're still there. We're making a decision. I'm, I'm either going to go in and have an intimate relationship with this with this God, yeah. or I'm not. Amen. And, uh, and I, the people that I see grow, maybe I, maybe it's not so much churches growing or not growing. Maybe it's people, <laughs> you know, that's growing or not growing. But the people who are making a decision in this moment to sing songs to him instead of about him, 
and build an intimate friendship with him are being totally transformed. And I get to watch it from where I'm sitting, and it's absolutely blowing my mind. It's I've never seen anything like it. I just I guess I wanted to see if y'all are having that same experience as you travel around that I'm seeing here. Yeah, I love it. Um, obviously, we know God is a God of seasons. And what is so beautiful about the kingdom is that every season has a sound. And especially when, you know, when it comes to worship, like if you look at Bethel, they, had, they don't sound like they used, used to sound 10 years ago. Hillsong doesn't sound, doesn't do the same songs, lyrics, right. melodies like they used to 10 years ago. That's because seasons have sounds, you know, and God isn't interested in, and obviously sometimes those seasons mix and we take out and, you know, bring old songs. I love hymns right. back, but God cares about the sound of seasons. Yeah. And, and, and when he, when he pauses the entire world, <laughs> the globe, you know, and all of a sudden now everyone is at this place where we have to say, you know, what does our relationship with the Lord look like? What has it been built upon? You know, I feel like the only response with that is to look back at him and start singing to him. Um, and I know for us, you know, for me personally, one of the best things about the pan- pandemic was it actually gave gave me time and it was very convicting to make sure, you know, my quiet time where I was, I was back to staring at his face, you know, um, really at how often I should have already been staring at his face, if that makes sense. And you would think people like us that that do ministry all the time would know that. Oh, I know. I have to be reminded. It's so simple. It's, I mean, it's Christianity 101, <laughs> but even, even Paul says in Philippians, he says, it's not a hardship for me to remind you of these things. Yeah. We, we need to be reminded. I needed to be reminded. Yeah. Pre- preferentially not through a pandemic, yeah. but. <laughs> True though, but I feel like it was uh, the, one of the very first, I felt like prophetic words that God spoke to me at the beginning of 2021 was, y'all trusted the wrong thing. I mean, it was just a simple sentence. Mm-hmm. And, and I and I begin to delve into that in my prayer life, and I begin to hear him say, "I was like, what do you what do you mean?" We, he said, "You you trusted politics, you trusted your bank account, you trusted you you literally worship those things, you know." And uh, goes back to the old. Uh, I know we all three we've talked about this before, but John Bevere, I love John Bevere, and he wrote this book one time, and he and he said in that book, "You worship what you fear," and in the middle of reading that sentence, I thought, no, you don't. And then about three weeks later, I'm sitting and thinking about that sentence, and it dawned on me, yet you actually do. Because uh, the, wow. the definition of worship is the thing you give your attention to. And wow. if you have great fear, and you're like, if you have a great fear of man, like, or fear of failure, then you give an inordinate amount of attention to failure. And it be, eventually, you will you will worship failure. And I think what the church did uh, before the pandemic that we've we we've, we've trusted the wrong thing. If it was let's get the right people elected so we can have a move of God, you know, or let's let's worship the way we've been doing church because that will bring a move of God. And and we be, we were worshiping the wrong thing, and we trusted the wrong thing to bring Him. And he's he just. He stopped all of it. He said, I'll shut the whole thing down to get your attention. Not that I think he caused it, but I think he used it. Uh, and he, he might have, uh, he had definitely allowed it. Yeah. I mean, and so it became for us, for me personally, like, wow, the thing that I thought would get us over the hump, all it really did was distract me from his truth. And, we went back 101 here, and it, it was about the gospel. It is about the love of Christ, and it is about letting people know what their identity is in him, period. Yeah. Nothing else. Because yeah. if you find your identity in something else, you'll worship that thing. Yeah. You really will. You'll worship. So we worship the way we did it. We worship politics. We worshiped people in politics. We And God said, I will not let my church be built on that. You know, God, the reason that God said, we, we look at the Ten Commandments and we think, God said, you can have no other gods before me because God's insecure and and he, he just couldn't stand the thought of being second. And that's not why he wrote that at all. God is the most non-insecure yeah. <laughs> entity that is ever in the universe that he created. 
He said, you can't have no other gods before me because no other God can get you where I can take you. Yeah. I love you too much to let that happen. Yeah. Every one of the Ten Commandments are written based on grace and love. And I just felt the church had to find its way back to its simplest form mm -hmm. to grow again. And I talked a lot right then, didn't I? No, I love it. I, it I really love good. all of that. What? So it was really good. It was really good. Even well, even when we talk about, you know, because people are like, well, did the Lord allow it? Did he cause it? Regardless of how it happened, you know, even when we look at the judgment of God in scripture, he would, you know, he would, you know, allow something bad to happen to his people or something like that. But it was always to restore. And it was always out of love. And, and his, his end goal in mind was, was to bring them to where they were created to be in the first place. And that's such, such a beautiful thing when you're going through hard things, you know, regardless of why they happened or, or who allowed it or any of that. It's like Jesus, his plan is for us to, to be able to walk with him through the fire and, and to get to the other side looking like him, but for us to become who we were created to be. Well, every, every corrective thing from Genesis to Revelation and beyond was, was based in love. 100%. I mean, every single time. There was a phrase I heard a while back, and I love it. Uh, they said, to, get, to have the peace that surpasses understanding, you have to give up your right to understand. And, and I think, especially in the American modern church today, is that we have so much information at our hands. It's like, get it now. And so when we, have, we go through things and we approach our relationship with God, a lot of times we have, it's like we come to God and we say, I have to understand why this happened. And, you know, and we look, our relationship is basically just trying to get information from him instead of just saying, I don't know why this happened. And, you know, and I, there's some things that I just don't know. And even just relinquish that right to have to know why wow. and saying, Lord, I trust you. And I know that you're good. My mom, I, I, from the time I was a little kid, she always told me, David, no matter what happens, God is always good. And I've just stood on that simple phrase. When I would have tragedy strike, I remember my first response would just be, Lord, thank you that you are good, you know, and it's foundationally just set up, I think just set up my life just to stay steady, even when it, there was, you know, rocky times, you know, yeah. but it was just steady in the Lord of Lord, you're always good. And I may not understand why, and I may not ever understand why. And gratitude, living a life, a grateful life has literally nothing to do with whether things are going well. Come on, come on. It really doesn't because... Uh, and that's one of the things that I challenge our church to do because people who are people who are worshipful, people who who let me let me just take a step back. People who are intimate with the Father have hearts of worship, and people who are worshipers have hearts of gratitude. No matter what they face, you know, it's the hardest losses of my life when I choose to be grateful for for who God was anyway. Always took me deeper to Him. And uh, and I feel like that the worshipers, here's what I think about praise and worship. We call it that in churches like your church, our church. I think the praise part is when you run around and you're, you're excited. And I think you can clap and praise God with a whole group of people, but I don't think you can worship with a whole group of people. There may be other people worshiping with you in that same space, but I think worship is you and him. And uh, even if the guy right beside you is doing it too, it's still just your worship. I think you can praise him together, but I think you can only worship him one-on-one. -on -one. And I think the people who are here in the heart and the secrets of the heart of the Father right now are people who are worshipers. And the only people who are worshipers are people who stay grateful. And uh, I don't, that's just my thought on it. But, uh, so uh, in, the, in, the, in the middle of this, of what I, all I just said about people who are grateful, or people who are worshipers, what what has God taught you? Uh, what secrets of his heart has he taught you about himself? And what have you seen different in your worship this year? Now, that's a great question. Uh, the thing that stands out the most is, I remember in the past when I would worship the Lord, and a lot of times my most intimate worship times was in my car. I'd put on worship music, and sometimes I would just drive around, and I would just pray and worship the Lord, and I would just encounter His presence. And most of those times, it wasn't hard. It's like His presence would show up. And then uh, as life goes on, you get busy. And even just in some of the most, what would seem like most intimate church 
service times, I remember sometimes I just wouldn't feel feel his presence. It felt hard, felt difficult. And uh, I was in the service one day. We weren't leading worship. We were down in the congregation. And I remember I was so tired. And the last thing I wanted to do was give any, any energy to press in to God. I just remember it was, I just did not feel it at all. And I remember the Lord said, it's like he, he told me, hey, this is the next level. This is a level of maturity for you to, to get to, is that when you're tired, press into me. And so I remember I just said, okay, I don't feel like it, but I'm just going to worship him. I'm going to just start glorifying him and make my body come into submission, you know, type of thing. And I remember it was like five or 10 minutes and it felt like it took forever. But all of a sudden I pressed through and I got past my physical self, even my mental, you know, my mind was exhausted. And I just had this just strong encounter with God. And it was almost just like this, wow, of even just the times I don't feel like it, you know, of just keep going, of, of pressing through t- to meet him. Because sometimes, you know, he'll show up right away. But then sometimes it's like he wants us to pursue him. Yeah. You know? Sure. And sometimes I wonder if it's those, those moments when he shows up right away in the, in the moments where we have to press in. I don't know how you feel about it, but sometimes I feel like I'm the problem when it's when it's the pressing in part. There's something of me that I need to empty myself of, you know, that's in the way because I think he always kind of I think he always wants to be with us. Oh yeah. Uh, what 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 was your year like? And as you as you went around different places leading worship, what what secrets of his heart did he reveal to you this year? You know, I think for, for me this past year, it's really just been a matter of faithfulness. Um, he's so faithful. And then um, us being faithful to him. My favorite place is the secret place. It's not it's not being in front of crowds. It's me sitting with my Bible in our bedroom and me just hearing the voice of God. And um, I, I think for me personally, it's just been, it doesn't matter what's going on in life. If I have that secret place moment, everything's going to be okay. Yeah. And I think that's really what the church is coming back to. It's valuing God for who he is, that he is faithful. And then just really he's producing within us um, the ability to be faithful to him. And uh, so last year for me, and it's, I, and it's kind of funny because I don't know if I always have these like aha moments when it comes to worship. Um, I think for more, it's kind of been this thing of continual faithfulness. And that's just my favorite thing. Yeah. And, um, so I think the year before it was that as well, but, um, (laughs) when you press into the secret place, you begin to get desperate for it and it begins to be the place that sustains you, the thing that sustains you. Um, but it just gets better. You know, it's not like it is, it didn't get old. He shows you you more things about, about himself and his nature and character and and things that you need to change. But I, so I guess his faithfulness and then our faithfulness to him in the secret place. Well, he's the anchor to our soul. And I think, I think. Really, what I heard both of you say is, is figuring out what you can't live without. Yeah, you know what you can live without and what you can't live without. And I think the faithfulness to pursue Him because we can't live without Him. We thought we could, because I think the church had gotten so busy doing and being church that we did a whole lot of it without Him. Mm-hmm. And I think this past year too, He said, "No more." Well, I allow that. You know, so. Well, and I even think, and I'm, I might say this in my message. It's, it's interesting that we're kind of talking about this because I feel like my message is going to fit in tomorrow with some of the, some of these things. Um, but it's crazy to me. Jesus didn't leave the earth so the Holy Spirit could come and then we ignore him. And I think that's kind of where we've been at is, you know, we've relegated him to a corner and then we pull him out when hard situations come but if, if part of the Godhead is moving and breathing and living throughout the earth and, you know, he wants to encounter us. And so it's, it's getting back to that place again of intimacy with God and really caring about the things that matter. And so what matters and exactly what you said, all these other things don't matter. They're temporal. They really don't. That's good. I think I could sit and talk to you guys because for, for one, I, I think we've always had a, a kindred spirit about us, but I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's anything but the fact that I know you guys are worshipers, you know, and I know that the one thing that I want to do the whole rest of my life is, is not miss worshiping him, not being, not miss intimacy with my father because it's changed my whole world. I mean, uh, uh, when I, when I, when I discovered the Holy spirit and, and y'all are like, 
well, yeah, you grew up in a church. Your dad was a preacher. But we didn't know about the Holy Spirit when I was a kid. I didn't. And my dad might have, or my grandparents may have known about him, but I didn't know about him. But when I had my first encounter with the Holy Spirit and I recognized that he was real, and then I began to study that thing out, uh, you know, like uh, Robert Morris wrote this book, that God I Never Knew. Uh, I read that book and I thought, I should have wrote this because this is like, it's what happened to me. But just meeting the Holy awesome. Spirit and finding him to be real and to be present. I mean, I, I said this one time in, in, a, in a sermon, Jesus didn't hear anymore. And I, I saw their looks, everybody know, and, and I almost felt weird saying it. Uh, but he's not. He he didn't. He left. And he said to us, I'm going to leave something for you that's better than me being present with you. Yeah. And he said, I'm going. And, we're, and, he's, and where he went is, is exactly where he is right this minute. He is now seated at the right hand of his father, waiting on God's, God's direction to come get us. Yeah. But in the meantime, the Holy Spirit is alive and real. And he's here. And he's in this room. And he's in your heart. And he's in your soul. Amen. And he can fill you, and baptize you, and transform your life, transform your worship, and transform the direction of your life. And I think that's the key component that he's pulling us back to in this moment. So. And you just said my entire message tomorrow for tomorrow well, morning. Well, the good news is the <laughs> podcast will not be released for a few weeks. <laughs> so make sure you guys go back and listen to the message. <laughs> that's exactly. Great. Well, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, what, a, what a privilege every single time to get to partner with you guys on anything. And uh, Same. Man, it's a, it's a blessing to have you guys back. And our people that, that watch our podcast always respond well and uh, to you guys because you're so real. I mean, y'all are both so real, and, and I love that about you. So thank you. Thank you for being here this weekend. Thank you for being my friend. Thank you that uh, we're going to end up in heaven together forever and ever and ever one of these days. Uh, but no, for real, thank you for your faith. I'll make sure to fly over to your mansion. We'll hang out. Well, I mean, you may live right beside me. You never know. Oh. That's right. <laughs> But thank y'all seriously for for your fa- for your faithfulness to the gospel because I think it's the, it it, it marks that marks your ministry and I, I appreciate that very much about the both of you. So well, we love you guys yeah, and we're so definitely. grateful for your friendship and grateful to be here and we're just excited to keep on doing life with you guys. Amen. You want to tell them bye, bro? Say what? You want to tell them bye? Say what's up? See y'all later. Join in next time. All right. Thank you.